I want to begin by recalling just how antique Hegel is looked at from today. To give just one illustration, although the historical constructivist par excellence, Hegel never knew Darwin and possibly rejected Lamarck's theory of evolution, which he did know about. He held that, and I quote, man has not developed himself out of the animal, nor the animal out of the plant. Each is at a single stroke what it is. In nature, he said, and including the nature of the human organism, there happens nothing new under the sun. For Hegel, only mind has a history. But if you live at a time when people believe that the whole natural world was created just as it is in one moment, and remained as it is until, and I quote, the lightning of life strikes into matter, then there's bound to be some kind of religious slant to your thinking. But Hegel's idea of a spirit animating human history is not as alien to our thinking today as one might think. Following Herder, Hegel wanted to understand why and how a people had one history rather than another. What was the source of the specific culture and institutions that they had, and why those rather than those like any other people? Anyone who wants to understand social and cultural change today has the same concern with the spirit of our times, and Hegel's ideas on how the spirit of the time is constructed and how individuals fit into that is relevant today. Hegel's idea of a gestalt, or shape of consciousness, is the key. A gestalt is simultaneously a certain way of thinking, a certain way of life or social system if you like, and a certain material culture. Spirit is the identity or coincidence of these three things and nothing outside of that. So spirit is the nature of human beings en masse, as he said. Looked at in this way, surely it's not too difficult to read Hegel in such a way that spirit is not something presupposed at the beginning, but is purely and simply the coincidence of thinking, social practice and material culture. Such a reading, I would argue, is a non-metaphysical conception of spirit, that is, a pragmatic reading of Hegel, a reading which opens Hegel up for an appropriation of his prodigious insights without the unwanted baggage of a hermetic or pantheistic conception of an extra-mundane spirit. The most recent, most recent pragmatic readings of Hegel hinge around the concept of recognition. Recognition was first used by Hegel's predecessor, Fichte, to make a pragmatic critique of Kant. Individuals learn that they are free beings, when they are recognised as a free being by somebody else who is already free, summoning them to exercise their freedom and respect the other's property rights. That was Fichte's line. The young Hegel continued this pragmatic use of recognition, but in reverse. According to Hegel, Fichte had deduced the state from the individual, but what was required, thought Hegel, was to approach the nature of the individual from the nature of the whole community. And that is, of course, the whole idea of a gestalt. Up until 1805, Hegel gradually expanded the scope of the concept of recognition. But by 1805, it had lost its original focus and meaning. Recognition no longer referred to a confrontation between two mutually alien subjects or individuals, but for example to an individual's experience of seeing their products circulate on the market, or an individual's experience of protection under the rule of law. So from 1807, Hegel limited the scope of recognition and gave it its paradigmatic exposition in the master-slave narrative of the phenomenology. It is this relationship, sometimes combined with the expanded scope of earlier works, which provides the basis for what I call a narrow pragmatic reading of Hegel, commonly referred to as intersubjectivity, as opposed to the broad pragmatic reading which I will defend here. The aim of pragmatism is to do away with recourse to abstractions or universals deemed to have some kind of objective existence independently of the activity of human beings. The distinction between broad and narrow pragmatism is as follows. Narrow pragmatism wants to explain everything solely by means of essentially unmediated interactions between individuals. 
This would reduce social life and history to some kind of gigantic chain reaction, a discrete series of events without any kind of continuity binding them together. This narrow pragmatism corresponds to the spirit of postmodern liberalism, which was given its canonical expression by Johann Fichte. Broad pragmatism, on the other hand, understands that all interactions are mediated. Mediation between subjects depends on the prior existence of a material culture, which is subject to interpretation in common projects or conflicts. Without this shared culture, inherited and modified by each generation, social life and indeed any human life is impossible. It is this role of material culture which is systematically ignored by liberalism in general and narrow pragmatism in particular. For Hegel, every relation is mediated. At the very beginning of the science of logic, he says, for example, there is nothing, nothing in heaven or in nature or in the mind or anywhere else which does not equally contain both immediacy and mediation. So it's absolutely fundamental to what Hegel has to teach us. Even the concept of being is mediated by all the social development that went into making the first philosophical reflections of Thales and Parmenides at the beginning of the history of philosophy. This question of mediation takes us to Hegel's social and ethical ideas and his vision of modern society. According to Hegel, modernity is a society in which there is no single mandated form of life. And yet, people exercise their freedom as individuals thanks to being part of a state. This contrasts with traditional communities, such as Hegel believed existed in ancient Greece, where a single form of life was mandated, and an individual was simply an individual instance of their city-state. According to Hegel, modernity arose through interactions between formerly self-contained communities and the submerging of a multiplicity of notions of the good and ways of seeing things and ways of life into a common form of life. The problem is in understanding how such a process can occur, because mutually foreign subjects with no common language or culture, no trading relations, no shared ethos or religion or law cannot interact. They are each to the other a wild force of nature. War to the death or mutual indifference are the only alternatives. Unmediated intersubjectivity is an impossibility. And this is not just a question of cultural origins or prehistory. Exactly the same problem arises whenever new social movements, new natural scientific paradigms and so on come onto the scene. Interaction is possible only thanks to mediation. Recognition is about finding the resources by means of which mutually alien subjects or communities or social movements may interact with one another. In his 1803 system of ethical life, Hegel begins with the origins of consciousness in the separation of needs and the means of their satisfaction. Instead of what is given by nature being immediately consumed, a gap opens up between consumption and production. This gap is mediated by labour. Labour itself generates new needs, needs met by new products. Nature is thus supplemented by a second nature in the form of an artificial environment. Along with the separation of consumption and production comes a division of labour, the possibility of supervision of labour, the differentiation of theory and practice, and most importantly, a surplus product. A self-contained community which produces no surplus or anything of use to anyone else, which is unable to utilise the labour of others, and when confronted by an, an outsider can only fight to the death. No mystical Kojevian drive to domination is needed here. In the absence of mediation, outsiders are more dangerous than a horde of locusts. But if a community produces something of use to others and is able to work under supervision, then they are candidates for conquest and exploitation. Conversely, if they are producing a surplus and know how to supervise labour, then they can exploit others. 
along with being able to defend themselves in the fight to the death and repel the attack of others, these are the preconditions for recognition. What is involved here is the division of the subject in two, into needs and the means of their satisfaction, into subject and object. If the conquered subject can be incorporated into a system of needs and labour within the life project of another subject, then the first step towards modernity can be taken. That's what recognition is about. To reiterate, if there is no shared system of law, language, labour and culture to mediate interactions, no third party to mediate, then subjects can interact by splitting in two, with the needs of one mediating between the other's needs and the means of their satisfaction, whilst the labour of the other mediates between the first needs and their satisfaction. In other words, the subjects both differentiate into subject objects so as to be incorporated into a single project or system of needs and labour, a circumstance, of course, in which one is subordinated into the project of the other dominant subjectivity. But as Hegel shows, this initial subordination to another form of life proves to be the first step towards modernity. Now, I want to consider a couple of writers to whom others have turned in search of a foundation in practical social psychology for a pragmatic reading of Hegel. Firstly, George Herbert Mead. Mead was part of the progressive movement in the United States with the American pragmatists John Dewey and Charles Sanders Peirce. Mead did no experimental work. He certainly had brilliant insights and a systematic approach and clearly understood Hegel though. According to Mead, people use symbols to communicate. A significant symbol is one which brings about the same effect in another person as it would in oneself. This use of signs is possible because their meaning is public and shared within a whole community. The individual has internalised the practices and institutions of their community and the attitude they take towards others constitutes social practices both for the self and for the whole community or group. The paradigmatic symbol for Mead is the gesture. The gesture originates from the initial movements towards some action, what Mead calls adopting an attitude, and the capacity of the taking of that attitude to generate an appropriate response from another individual. The way Mead deals with the problem of the formation of self-consciousness, that is the ability to look at oneself from outside and take the standpoint of another, parallels Hegel's solution to the problem. Mead splits the self in two, into an I and a me, in which the I is the subject, which is doing something, and observes the me, which is the object, which has done something. The I gets to know about the me immediately through others, by seeing others taking an attitude to the self and being able to place oneself in the position of the other, and thus to observe oneself as an object from the standpoint of the general community. So by thinking in terms of the use of publicly available, culturally produced and defined artefacts, and by understanding the constitution of self-consciousness immediately through the splitting of the self into a subject and object, Mead makes a passably good pragmatic reading of Hegel's conception of recognition. However, once his following in the school of symbolic interaction is petered out in the 1960s, those who have used Mead's work in more recent times transformed his theory into one of intersubjectivity, in which the interactions are unmediated interactions between already constituted individual subjects, who, like prisoners in neighbouring cells, contrive somehow to send messages to one another. The opening that Mead gave to this kind of interpretation is that his paradigmatic artefact was the gesture. The gesture can be taken as a private product subsumed into the individual person. In truth, Mead's conception of mediation, like Hegel's, is very much the use of a shared public material culture. But the spirit of the times is stronger than any individual, especially when they're dead. Without an organised school of empirical, critical or research and practice, Mead's original insights became the property only of specialists in the history of science. But also, as we shall see, symbolic interactionism was overtaken in the 1960s by another kindred current of social psychology. 
I will now briefly touch on another writer who has contributed to a pragmatic interpretation of Hegel, Donald Winnicott. Winnicott's contribution is special because he was a psychoanalyst and consequently believed in innate drives rather than cultural historical construction. Winnicott described how mother and infant begin tied up in a single system of activity, a single subjectivity with no separate needs. The relation between the two individuals is mediated by the mother's breast. The mother must learn how to offer her breast to the child in such a way that it seems to the child that the breast is its own creation, but the two must separate, the mother recovering her own life and the child becoming a free agent. The mother's breast or another transitional object, such as a teddy bear or security blanket, mediates this process of deremption. The transitional object is an emotion-laden object which the child holds until it is able to be by itself. My point here is that this transitional object mediates between what will become two self-conscious subjects. In the beginning, they have no means of mediating their relation, not because they are foreign to one another, but because they are merged. The formation of self-consciousness here also requires a mediating artifact. Again, it involves delayed gratification in the formation of a system of needs, this time by differentiation rather than merging. The paradigmatic artifact for Winnicott is the mother's breast. Again, this choice of a paradigmatic artifact for the exposition of the formation of self-consciousness leaves Winnicott open to a mistaken intersubjective interpretation in which the mediating artifact, the mother's breast, is naturalized as the private expression of an individual. Just as with Mead, for Winnicott also, the formation of self-consciousness demands the use of a mediating artifact, but when taken up in recent times to ground the pragmatic interpretation of Hegel, the centrality of the mediating artifact is overlooked, and the relation modelled instead on the liberal conception of intersubjectivity. In both cases, the mediating element is paradigmatically a body part. In this context, the human body is rightly considered as an artifact, a material product fashioned by human labour passed on through human history. The body itself, not just uses of the body such as gestures or breastfeeding. But beyond the paradigmatic artifact, in the case of me, mediation between individuals is achieved by significant symbols and these significant symbols include writing in all forms of language as well as unconscious gestures. In the case of Winnicott's object relations theory, any kind of artifact can uh, mediate as a transitional object. Now, turning to Hegel. In the system of ethical life, Hegel specifies three types of paradigmatic activity through which the universal is constructed. One, the use of tools or means of production. Two, the use of words, or tools of reason, as he says. And three, the raising of children. So for Hegel, the specific kinds of interactions which go to the construction of human society and consciousness involve at least three kinds of mediating artifacts, tools, symbols, and the next generation. And the correlation with Mead's category of signs, index, symbol, and icon is suggestive too. Note that Hegel does not conceive of the process here as paradigmatically communication. Both instrumental action and communicative action are grouped with the reproduction of labour as activities through which mind is constructed, and the mediating element include the entirety of material culture. Self-consciousness presupposes consciousness. The consciousness of a community and its members whose activity is directed at objects and aware of itself as having one among many possible points of view. The development of self-consciousness presupposes the capacity of the subject to sustain itself and produce something of use to others, to have needs which belong to other subjects, and to be able to divide within itself, so to speak, and supervise its own activity. It seems to me that despite the impenetrability of Hegel's exposition and the antiquity of his conception, this system is richer than any of the interpretations just mentioned. 
Axel Honneth set out to develop Habermas's discourse ethics into an ethics of dessert based on individuals' need for recognition and using a psychology of intersubjectivity. He has appropriated Winnicott's analysis of weaning and Mead's IME relation via Hegelian notions of recognition. However, because Honneth has erased the mediating element in each case, he has simply assimilated some good ideas to a narrow pragmatism. Honneth renders Winnicott's model of successful weaning as the first species of recognition. I see three possible interpretations. One, Honneth is simply drawing our attention to Winnicott's contribution to motherhood. Two, he is stretching the concept of recognition to cover a quite different relation. Or three, Winnicott's conception of weaning is intended as an exemplar for successful deremption by means of which a new subject differentiates itself from another and establishes its independence. But such an appropriation cannot succeed without highlighting the central role of the transitional object, the emotion-laden thing which functions as a symbol of the former subjectivity, emotionally reinterpreted in the process of transition. Because when it regards this process as a species of recognition as essentially unmediated, he skates over Winnicott's claim in relation to the transitional objects and sees no opportunity for incorporating the idea of emotion-laden objects in his understanding of love, recognition or deremption. But how can you appropriate object relations theory without the transitional object? Likewise with Mead, by focusing on the IME relation, when it can pass over mediation only because the limiting case of another's mediation of a person's relation to themselves is easily mistaken as a dyadic relation between two unitary selves. Likewise, Mead's paradigmatic significant symbol, the gesture, is easily subsumed into the activity of the self, eliding its public and cultural character. But Mead without mediation is senseless. Nevertheless, this meeting, reading, misreading of Mead is in line with many present-day misreadings of Mead. But Honneth does not stop here. Honneth uses this model of unmediated transactions between individuals as a paradigm for the construction and enjoyment of rights in a society governed by the rule of law. This is utterly misconceived. The rule of law is mediation of relations between individuals par excellence. Individuals do not negotiate between the two of them the laws to which their interactions will be subject. Individuals are born or naturalised into a society whose laws are already in place. Recognition here simply means that they are recognised as a member of the given community. Horror appropriates not Mead's general social psychology, but specifically his theory of the self, in order to support a concept of recognition as constructive of self-respect through the enjoyment of rights. But the whole point of rights is that the law is blind, not personal. Doubtless the idea that the enjoyment of rights, that is to say inclusion within a community in which citizens enjoy rights and have consented to the norms regulating life within the community, is fundamental to the development of self-respect. But this process is not accidentally but essentially mediated. It is, utterly, it is utterly incomprehensible within a universe constituted by individuals abstracted from the material culture mediating their interactions. Honneth's appropriation of Hegel's idea of recognition is complex. He draws both on the overextended conception of recognition immediately preceding the phenomenology and the incidental references to recognition in the mature philosophy of right. Here Honneth hopes to reconstruct a theory of distribution of goods in a community by recognition of what a person deserves for their contribution to the community. This Honneth claims engenders self-esteem and builds social solidarity. Much could be said about this position which is riddled with contradictions, but I will limit myself to the observation that the granting of rewards and recognition of contributions to the community is an explicitly mediated process. Not only that, if the process is to be subsumed as a species of recognition, then both the community and the individual must be constituted as subjects. 
Thus, the model of intersubjectivity is overreached in two ways. Firstly, the relation is mediated in its very essence, and secondly, one of the parties is a collective subject, which begs the whole question of intersubjectivity. For Honor, it is the individual person, not the corporate entities who are subjects. It also begs the question of social solidarity. This brings us to Honneth's Kantian reading of Hegel. For Hegel, the participants in recognition relations are essentially subjects, and for Hegel, a subject is not an individual. The point is how an individual is to become a subject, and so the, the presumption that recognition is about intersubjectivity, that is a relation between individuals, misconstrues everything. Reading Hegel as a tale about individuals coming together to recognize each other and negotiate relations of mutual esteem, etc., is to miss everything that Hegel was about and to impute to him the kind of liberalism that his whole work was directed against. But Hegel's conception of subjectivity has something to offer social psychology, which Mead was well aware of. Hegel offers the prospect of overcoming the gulf separating our understanding of individual psyche and social structure. Hegel's notion of formations of consciousness manifested in social formations begs for a broadly pragmatic interpretation. Honneth, however, simply presumes that psychology, and a poorly thought out psychology at that, can capture social movements by switching planes from individual psyche to social movements and institutions, understood now as a large number of people with the same feeling of disrespect or lack of self-esteem. One final observation. When Hegel said that everything is mediated, he also said that everything is immediate. Social movements and institutions are only constituted by immediate interactions. Ideals do not exist in some nether world. But the way universals exist in and through relations between individuals can only be understood by paying attention to how these interpersonal relations are mediated and how an individual's knowledge of the universal is mediated both by other individuals and the material culture um, that the individuals use in their collaboration with each other. The only current of social psychology which has developed this legacy is the school of Lev Vygotsky, who received their Hegel via Marx in the Soviet Union of the 1920s. They also had the benefit of a visit by John Dewey in 1928. Like contention is that as Vygotsky's following in cultural historical activity theory, CHAT for short, which offers the really fruitful opportunity to ground a pragmatic reading of Hegel on a real living school of practical social psychology. The basic insights of CHAT is that even though the human animal is just a network of stimulus response reactions, the nervous system allows us to introduce in between a stimulus and a response, what Vygotsky calls a psychological tool. So the single stimulus response link now has a mediating link. Just as even the most elaborate machine still obeys the laws of physics, this modified nervous system is an artifact, it is constructed. Psychological tools originate from the collaborative use of objects in the environment. Human beings do not live in a natural environment. We live in a second nature made up of artifacts accumulated over generations. And we are oriented to live in this constructed ecological niche. The objects in this artificial environment are given meaning through the collaborative activity of human beings, in which artifacts are used in specific ways Formally, it's the same as Mead's idea, but crucially, although Vygotsky more or less agreed with Mead on gestures, for Vygotsky, the gesture was not the paradigmatic artefact. For Vygotsky, it is emphatically the entirety of material culture, symbolic culture as well as the means of production and the human body. It did not ascribe, for instance, any difference in principle between tools and signs. Also, as a living scientific current, Chat has not simply relied on an abstract conception of internalization, for example, but has systematically traced a whole series of transformations which an artifact undergoes through its use in the form of an external material object, such as an aid memoir, through to an internal psychological tool as such. 
This current was kept more or less under lock and key in Stalin's Soviet Union, but in the 1960s it was able to make contact with psychologists in the West and through a steady stream of translations and visits gradually implanted itself in the US and now almost every country in the world. Whereas Mead psychology had been dispersed and the pressure of the spirit of the times was in its pure form no longer a significant influence in practical social psychology which was dominated by intersubjectivity. Vygotsky's legacy has had the benefit of systematic testing and critique, albeit in, in isolation, and a whole series of great figures have further developed Vygotsky's original ideas. Now that it is a worldwide current, the modernist prejudices which had affected the Soviet school have been subject to critique from social movements in the West, much to the benefit of social psychology. On the other hand, the conditions of its existence in Stalinist Russia and in modern United States has largely meant that its own origins in Marx and Hegel and its commitment to social transformation have been to some extent suppressed. This conjuncture offers great opportunities for a fruitful reconnection of Hegel and Marx via Vygotsky.